Well, good evening, everyone. And I just want to say thank you, too, for everyone that sacrificed their evenings to come out and not so much listen what I have to say, but maybe what God is trying to tell us through all this. Tonight is our last evening, as has been said, and we're going to look at what is called how spiritual sin issues not dealt with lead to addiction. Now, I just want to give you a little bit heads up. Tonight, we're going to go into some deep things about immorality, what may be foreign or not heard of before, and maybe because you live in a different side of the world than we do in Bolivia, you may have all heard about it. And I just want to give you a heads up. So I think the Lord is going to do wonders again, and He's going to help us understand things and how to deal with things and wrap it up. As today is the last evening, that's why I kept this topic the last, the spiritual, the sin issues, because whatever happens to us, whatever triggers it in our lives, the end result is we end up somewhere in sin. And uh, the Lord wants to help us out of there. So to start with, sin is defined in the Bible as disobedience of the law of God. In 1 John 3, 4, it says like this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So that's what the Bible says. Sin is lawlessness. It's against God's word. So when it comes to understanding sin issues, we need to take to, into consideration that we are born with a sinful nature. It's not something that's passed on. And I think everybody in this room tonight knows that it's that way. In case you didn't, now you do. Because <laughs> the Bible t so clearly teaches us that the sinful nature isn't passed on. It's something we're born with. And sometimes it gets the best of us. And because of that, we hurt other people. So with this said, I want to say tonight, mention a few things we ha have no control over. You and I can change what others do or say to us. You and I can control what, other, what our parents did. Is it good, hurtful, or even bad that affected us? We can control what people in church say or do to us. And so many times, hurts come from church people. We can control what we experience in life, circumstances, a death in the family. And what I've seen over the years, the most painful and devastating is if someone in the family commits suicide. I don't know what it is like, but I've sat with people and it's a devastating thing. But we know the Lord even died on the cross for those things. So circumstances, people in life, pressure, and problems can emotionally damage us with the result that we're going, uh, with the result to going to emotional, we are going to emotionally respond to those pressures in life in one way or the other. And if not dealt with properly under the sovereign grace of God, people will go to a substance to numb that pain they are feeling, and that is in a sinful way into some kind of maybe addiction. And if not addiction, they will try to cover it some other ways. In all this we have looked at, we have no control over, and still Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, and give no opportunity to the devil. So what I'm trying to say is whatever we experience, whatever has been done to us, we have no control over, that this doesn't give me the right to go into any kind of sin or addiction. Because no matter what happens in my life, Scripture says in Ephesians 4.27, don't give any room to the devil. So as long as you and I have our guards up, according to Ephesians chapter 6, starting verse 10, the whole armor of God, and we use it, our, the Satan doesn't get any opportunity or we don't give him any opportunity or any chance because we don't allow him no matter what happens to us. But as soon as we let our guards down, he will take the opportunity as we give him the opportunity. Romans 6, 12 to 14 says, Let not sin therefore ring in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as in instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. Now we saw in the verse we read in the beginning that lawlessness or sin is lawlessness. And when we are born again and we are under the grace of God, law can control us. 
because we're under the grace of God. With this said, we want to go into our first main thought this evening, and that's bitterness. Bitterness is a built-up anger from past emotional pains. Now, there could be other definitions, too. I'm not saying this is the only one. Proverbs 14.10 says it this way, and it's very short. The heart knows its own bitterness. How about that? Every heart knows its own bitterness. If you struggle with bitterness, or better said, bitterness involves our memories of how others have hurt us in the past. So bitterness involves our men and, um, memories. If you struggle with bitterness, and I would ask you, who hurt you more than anyone else? You would answer that question because you know exactly. Your mind will go back to that person that hurt you and, and made you bitter. Now, you had no right to go to bitterness, but you did. And if there's anybody in this room that hasn't dealt with bitterness, I praise the Lord for that person. I would like them to come up and tell us how it's done. <laughs> I am one of them that's guilty about it too. So bitterness involves our memory. And if we struggle with it, it always goes back to the person that hurt us. Bitterness involves our attitude toward others for what they have done. So to say, where we are, whether we are angry at them, whether we feel rejected by them, whether we feel alone because they rejected and did not care for us, we find that bitterness has its ways of getting to us and builds up and, and, and better said, it starts with anger and starts building up by the time we get so bitter about this person or about the situation that we just lose control over it. As soon as we get angry and bitter, we have lost control of ourselves. Another thing, bitterness involves our feelings of pain, our emotional response to hurt and the emotional damage that we've experienced. So what is bitterness in a nutshell? It involves our um, memory, it involves our attitude, it involves our feelings. So that's why I ask you, if, if we go back in our lives and if somebody asks you, and if somebody comes to you and he's an angry, bitter person, and he just leashes or whatever you say, sheds it all on you and says, this is how I feel and whatever. And if you would ask him this question, like I did, who hurt you more than ever or anyone else in the past? Normally a person knows. Normally they do. But so many times it comes from a very close relative. It can come from our parents. So we don't want to talk about it. So many times I've experienced, and this is normal, natural, when a couple or even young people came into the office when I was at this rehab center, I grew up so wonderful. They had such great parents. And there is good. Every parent has good things to offer. But as we continued, all of a sudden, with time it came out, there was a string of bitterness started somewhere from maybe a parent that they didn't want to talk about. And it's not to blame our parents. It's not to say, oh, it's all their fault. It's to just admit the truth and deal with it. But we don't want to do it because we think right away, if I say that, I make it sound like it's all my parents' fault. And because of my parents, that's who I am and what I'm doing, so I won't talk about it, so I make it kind of come out so that it's not my fault. And some people do that way. They definitely do. But the main thing is to know the truth, where it came from. Not blaming anybody and taking ownership of it and dealing with it. It's easy for you and me to say to a person, I forgive you, intellectually. This problem is, the problem is, can we release the pain from the, from the heart? Bitterness can only be resolved if it's resolved at a heart level, not at an intellectual level, because you can say a hundred times, I forgive you, and never re release the person. Forgiveness must come from the heart where the pain is and the bitterness is stored. I'm going to give you an example. I've experienced it many times, and, and, and in the beginning, I couldn't really understand how does this function, how does this work, although I had some training in it, but it took me a while to catch on. 
a couple would come into my office, and whatever the issue was, they would say, I forgive you. Now, this is interesting. When the husband, the man has been unfaithful, the lady is always softer to forgive and easier to forgive than when the lady has gone, has been unfaithful. The man had a harder time forgiving than the lady. This is just what I've experienced. I'm not saying it's always that way. But here's what I was going to say. They come in and somebody has it one or the other has been unfaithful and they say, I have never told my spouse about it, so what will happen if I tell her or him? Well, I say, I'm here to help you along. So when this comes out, there's all kinds of reactions and emotions and, and so on. But then with time, one of them or the other says, I forgive you. Or it would just be cold and they look at each other and say, okay, I thought so and I figured so and I was wondering if that was happening, but I forgive you. Two to three weeks or days later, most of the times the lady first was back in my office, crying out of control. Now all that emotional stored up and that from this news is coming to surface. And now they have to deal with that emotional, what is going on. And out of that emotion comes all the bitterness and the anger. So just saying, I forgive you, many times from the head or from the knowledge of what we have doesn't work. It has to be dealt with on a heart level. The pain, the emotions they experience by what has gone on has to be dealt with. And if that doesn't happen, normally they won't forgive each other. Although they make it clear in their head and they say it loud and clear, but in their actions, one to another, it will be different. It will show otherwise. So another thing, consequence of if, if bitterness is not resolved, according to scriptures, leads to greater sins. Ephesians 4.31 says like this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. But ki be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. So if we don't deal with the bitterness, it says it leads to wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and the list could even go on. But he says put away with all this. So we see it leads to greater sins and more serious sins if we don't deal with that emotional anger and bitterness that we have stored up. Another one is will ruin other believers around us and so other people. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says, So to it, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. So bitterness gets worse. Bitterness is like cancer. It keeps on growing. So if we don't clean up our bitterness, it will, in other words, sometimes I say it this way, it will, it, will allow, it will not allow God's grace, through, especially through a Christian, will not allow God's grace to flow so other people can come to Christ. If a non-Christian meets a bitter believer, you think that person will be willing and longing to come to Christ? <laughs> I have heard so many times, if that is what's Christianity, I've heard this more than once, then I have no use for it. Because some bitter Christian talked with this non-Christian somewhere, or maybe became a friend, whatever reason. So the Bible is clear on it that bitterness defiles God's grace and brings many into trouble that we get together with. So that's why it's so important to clean up bitterness. Another thing we see, or just uh, coming, uh, going back a little bit, bitterness involves our memories, our attitude, anger, our feelings. It's easy for you and me to say to a person, I forgive you just by our intellectual head knowledge, but don't mean it from the heart, and it has to be dealt with from the heart. If not, it will have consequences way beyond you and I can imagine. 
And if a person hasn't dealt with her or his bitterness and marries that way, that bitterness is carried into the marriage. And all those things will one day, that bitterness will one day turn against that person they have married. It's interesting how that works. That's why I said, you, I said to you guys earlier that only 70% of couples or only 30% of married couples figure out their problem. 70% can't. Because all that, that you and I have experienced and haven't dealt with, we bring into the marriage. And all those things, most of the times, and if not mo uh, all those things, then at least a high percentage of the things we have been doing to other people will turn against our spouse. So that's why it's so important to deal with it. The big thing we have in, <laughs> against us is pride keeps us from resolving our problem. It's one of the main things in life. It's our pride. Second Timothy 3, 2 says, and, and definitely this talks to, Paul talks about in the end times how cold people will be, but we can take an application out of it. It says, for people will be lovers of self. Listen, first in the list, the lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, and the list goes on. Pride in itself is self-centered, focused on oneself. They are blind to the needs of the others. So if we are a prideful person, we won't see the needs of others. It affects our relationships, our priorities, our ministry, our attitude, and the way we talk. The biblical principle is to repent from pride and regard others higher than ourselves. It's the opposite than we normally would like to do it. And if we have an issue with pride and we don't deal with pride, and we get married with a high prideful attitude, it will just happen that your spouse, is it the lady or is it the guy, one of them will be damaged by that prideful attitude. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, say, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We see very clearly that the scripture tells us, do nothing from selfish ambition, but count others higher than yourself. And he says, but in humility, lift others up. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we see two things that are very important in spiritual issues. It's bitterness that we have to deal with and the pride that keeps us from repenting. With this, we want to go to our next one, and this is one that is, will go very deep, and that's called moral failure. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4, it says like this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. So the scripture over and over, and I just used one verse because it would give a long list that tells us that we have to live or give our body to, or live in sanctification as born-again believers and abstain from any and every immorality. The problem why immorality is getting worse because of all the available media options people have nowadays. It's so easy to get into it, so easy access to it. And it's because our world today, because of technology. Now, we can't blame technology, <laughs> but it's partly because of that. Here are some statistics to help us understand the problem we are facing in North America. And I hope that this won't... Uh, put too much uh, goosebumps on your arms or your body. There are 4.2 million pornography websites, which include 420 million pages of porno pornography on the internet. Now, that's a lot. And I'm just going to put this in here. I don't have this in my notes. 
a percentage of this pornography is very dangerous. It's all dangerous. But there's a percentage of this pornography before it's put on the internet for public people. And I've sat with people, that's why I know this. It's first brought to a witchcraft, and they pray over it in their spiritual, dynamic world. And it's almost as they put a curse on there, and it has a satanic power behind it, although everyone, every pornography is wrong and anti-God, but this one is special. And if a person looks at it once for five seconds on the internet, they're hooked. They'll go back. And it basically doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. Because there's spiritual beings, demons behind it that are really enforcing this. I never knew this until I got into counseling. So I want everyone to be very careful. Stay away from it. It is said that 40 million adults regular, regularly visit in, uh, internet porn sites. That is 40 million every day. 47% of Christians said that pornography is a major problem in their home. Now this is something that we wouldn't want to know. 90% of boys and 70% of girls aged 13 to 14 have viewed pr pornography. 86 million people look for pornography every day on the internet. 25% of people who spend time on the computer do so looking for or at pornography. One in three high school students is having sex. 25% of young people are involved in sexting, sharing sex Lee uh, explicit photos of themselves on the internet. 10% of young people have nudity pictures of themselves on their cell phone or online. 55% of young people aged 15 to 19 have engaged in oral sex. And I could have put a list of longer what's going on, but this is enough. So we see we live in a world facing immorality. But the good news is, Jesus said, I came to help you. So no matter how impossible it sounds for us, there is hope in Christ. There is hope in Christ. What Jesus did for us on the cross. The sacrifice he was willing to pay for us, there is hope. So what causes a person to get addicted to pornography? Today we're definitely going to talk about addiction, and this is one of the most common, worst addictions maybe that humanity struggles with in us as Christians and churches now and day. A normal saying is, or a secular saying, we could say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. But let's make it more accurate with scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Scriptures are very clear. Bad company ruins good morals. So we have to be very careful what we do in our lives. So the question is, why do people get into pornography? Here are many ideas. Some people get involved in porn because they are exposed to immoral, immoral activity and hate, and that moral activity leads them to be curious. They start looking for more material and find more material, and then as a result, get addicted. Sometimes it's by accident. Sexual abuse can cause a person to get involved. Many get sexually abused and that gets them to involved. Some people get involved in pornography because they feel rejected. And getting involved in immoral issues causes them to have a good feeling and covers the pain. And I've seen this many times too. It was even taught to me in, in training. And I found out it's true. So many people are there because they fill that void that needs to be filled up with love, with some kind of addiction. Some people are involved in, immor in moral failure because of defiance. They rebel against their parents and they get involved out of spite because they don't want to be controlled. Now, could being controlled is nothing wrong with, but it might come in an angry or in a bitter way from the parents. I don't know. Sometimes it is. And because they don't want this control and, and applied maybe in an unloving way, they do it out of spite. I've seen that too. Other people get involved in pornography to get even. The husband is involved in pornography, so the wife gets involved just to prove to him 
what it feels like to be involved. So there's this anger going on, getting even. But a lot of people have been so hurt earlier in life because of whatever happened that by the time they get to marry the life, they hate intimacy or sex. They can't stand it. And they are reacting to everything God meant to be a very beautiful thing. So we see pornography is one of the things that Satan uses nowadays and everybody has so easy access to, to destroy people from very young children. So if we, he can destroy us from very young, that means that he has won by the time they get to the marriage part that it probably won't work. The good news is it can all be fixed up. The good news is it can all be dealt with on a biblical level. And no matter what has happened in a person's life, they can have a rejoiceful, fulfilling marriage the way God designed it. The other thing is, how does pornography change a person's thoughts and thought patterns? Here's an interesting thing what Job said. Job 31, verse 1. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? See, this is Paul, or I mean uh, Job in the Old Testament. Now, he was a righteous man. It says he was a man, uh, could you almost say after God's own heart, he was a righteous man. And here he says, I've made a covenant with my eyes, giving us to understand that he got into temptation too, but he knew how to deal with it. Pornography changes a person the way they think, the way they see themselves, the way they look at others, and the way they treat others. I'm going to go into three lies that people believe about pornography, people that are into it. The first lie about pornography is, it doesn't hinder me. It's the first lie. Could be second, but I put it as first. Proverbs 7.10 says like this, And behold, the woman meets him, dresses as a prostitute, wily at heart. In other words, has it all planned out. It could be a guy too. Here it talks about a woman. If I were to ask you this question, I did this before. When was the first time you looked at pornography and still wants to pop up every now and then. But no, it doesn't bother us. We lie to ourselves. We do. Now here's a list of things what pornography teaches, and I've just taken some of them. Pornography teaches men that ladies are just a, an object or a substance to fulfill my pleasure and go from one to, uh, to the other. That's what pornography teaches. Men, that ladies are just an object to use. Pornography teaches mankind that the best sex is outside of a loving relationship. No emotional love connection is needed just to fulfill my sex desire. It's another one. Because th they wouldn't say it that way, but that's how they present it. That's how it's brought out. Pornography rewires the mind about intimacy. The guy thinks every girl, lady, woman wants sex right away. They don't get emotional. They didn't get emotional love growing up. Now they want sex without any emotional connection. So many times it happens where there's this love emotional connection not met and not given to children as they grow up. When they come, become adults, they jump, I, I call it this way, they jump this emotional connection and go to the sexual one and try to fulfill this emotional void with the sexual part. And that's why so many people feel, even in marriage, feel sexually abused. Because there's no emotional connection, but there's just this drive and whatever else all to the sexual part. It's almost not to comprehend how Satan tries to mess us up and we get the wrong idea about what God designed it should be. Another one, the opposite is that every girl, lady, woman wants an emotional love connection without sex. 
and that can lead to the sexual relationship, which then is fulfilled the way God designed it. It's also guys. Most guys want an emotional love connection. And if they don't want it, it means it's distorted very youngly, and I'm going to go that, into that a little later. Pornography makes the guy think that a lady likes the immoral behavior from him, and if needed, put pressure on her. Wrong. It's not that way. But that's what pornography does. Pornography makes a guy believe if he kind of behaves in an immoral way in front of a lady or a girl, that will make the lady think, oh, and it's not that way. Just so you get this right, pornography makes the guy think that a lady likes the immoral behavior from him, and if needed, put pressure on her. Maybe a little bit of pressure would work if she doesn't get the hint. And it's all wrong. It's abusive. 19% of young people suffer from premature sexual arousal. Now, what does that mean? The way I understand God has created us, and I just understand a very tiny bit of it, that as we grow, there comes a time when puberty time comes. And that's when these hormones should start to be functioning, and that's how God created it. But if a person gets sexually abused by, and I can talk out of experience, by three, four, five, and maybe even younger years, that sexual hormone that's supposed to sleep until the age of or 12, 13, 14, somewhere out there, is being awakened and stimulated and something happens to that person that they don't know how to handle and deal with and this young mind is all confused. The damage that happens when it happens so young. And again, I just want to give you hope. No matter what the struggles we have gone through, no matter what has happened to us, God, through Jesus Christ, has hope. He wants to help us with it. So that's why 90% of young people suffer from premature sexual arousal because of the sexual abuse they've gotten very young and their sexual hormones have been awakened way before they should be. So the first lie is, it doesn't hinder me. Do you still believe that? I know you didn't from the beginning. The second lie about pornography is, I'll stop later. How about that? Sounds good, huh? I'll stop later. I will continue secretly, but I will stop later once I'm married. Not so. Because the emotional love connection that is supposed to be between a married couple is cold. I've said this before, and I'll mention it more than once today. A person in pornography or in any immoral failure can't love their spouse or any other person more than 3%. So that's why when somebody in a marriage is unfaithful and he tries to keep it secret and he thinks he has it all covered, the other spouse feels something because they don't get what they need. So they only get 3% of that emotional love connection they should get from their partner. The rest is given to that other person or people. Here's an interesting thought. Dopamine is the chemical released in your brain that makes you feel good. Now, when we look at Psalm 139, verse 14, it says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So this chemicals we have and how God created us, which I only understand a very tiny bit about, and I know medical doctors that study this and <laughs> dedicated their life, they know and, and always learn more about how the body works. But according to God's word, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I want to tell you a little bit, or give you maybe a little bit to understand what this dopamine does. And as I just said, it's a chemical released in your brain that makes you feel good. When this chemical is messed up with pornography, it starts functioning totally different about love and intimacy. See how Satan tries to get to the root of it to mix it up? This chemical makes you feel good about what's wrong and makes you feel wrong of what's right in God's books. Listen to this so you understand. There are many guys out there 
that believe God has made them to love guys. There are many women out there that believe God has made them to love women. If a guy at a very young age gets sexually abused by another guy, this dopamine chemo, or a, um, you know, dopamine ch chemical or hormone gets programmed to love guys in a sexual way and emotional way. And that's what Satan likes to do. Program the person against God from as young as possible. If a girl at a very young age gets sexually abused by another girl or lady, her dopamine chemical gets programmed to love other girls or ladies in a sexual way. So their central love component is all messed up. So they really believe and are convinced we are made that way. Because they're abused from so young, maybe they don't even remember that, or from, and if they do, their chemi uh, this, this chemical dopamine, if I uh, pronounce it right, is messed up because they got this love that they needed in a wrong way, in an abusive way. And they didn't need this sexual love at that time. They need this emotional love. What we see is that so their central love component that God created in a person, this emotional love connection is malfunctioning now because somebody messed it up. And that's why people are so convinced that this is the way God created them. Another one is another chemical or hormone is oxytocin. I could have used more, but I've just used a few to give, get the point across and help us understand a little bit. Oxytocin is the chemical or hormone that is called the love hormone. It is also associated with sympathy, trust, sexual activity. So if a child has been treated immoral, immorally from very young or has watched pornography, their dopamine and their oxytocin is all wired up wrong their understanding about feeling love and trusting is all messed up. So if this happens to a young boy, they will really believe. Now let me use a little bit of an illustration here. And this is a story that I read in, in the Caring for the Heart material. And I won't say it exactly how it is there, but just kind of paraphrasing. A couple had a boy. They were both working all this. They never had time for him. But they had an uncle. He was, I guess, retired or something, and he had time. So they would bring him to his uncle, this six-year-old boy. And what happened is this uncle gave the attention he needed emotionally, which is nothing wrong with. He did everything to him emotionally what his parents should have done. But the problem was this uncle was in immorality. So from six years on, he started abusing him sexually. This young boy's, so to say, dopamine and oxytocin was all wired wrong. So he grew up as a homosexual, believing he loved guys and he loved to have intimacy with guys. One day he finds a woman. He gets married. If I remember correct, a few days after he got married, he turned to his wife and he says, I don't like you, I don't love you, I'm a homosexual. I've forgotten how many years they were married until they went to counseling. And the counselor, a counselor helped them through, understand what had happened, dealt with it on a biblical level. He confessed his sin. He admitted how he had been abused or misguided in all this, confessed his sin, cleared everything up. And on the way home, he turned to his wife, and he couldn't believe if I may use this word, how he lusted after his own wife. That had never happened before. And that's how it's supposed to be. But if it all, get, all gets messed up from very young, Satan has a way to mess up people from so young so they really believe this lie is true. And it's hard to convince them otherwise. But there is hope. Jesus has hope. So we have here Oxytocin is the chemical or hormone that is called the love hormone. It is also associated with, as, as said, sympathy, trust, sexual activity. 
So if it's a, ch a child, uh, like I mentioned, and let's put it this way. So if all this is messed up, no wonder a couple can never connect emotionally and trust and love the, the way God designed it. A person in pornography thinks wrongly about love and feels wrong about love. S sitting with people in counseling, I have been shocked to see how a female struggles to let another female go in a sexual immoral way. And how a guy struggles to let him go of another guy in an immoral sexual way. Satan wants to believe. Satan wants us to believe a lie, and that's why he wants to mess us up from as young as possible. So what we see with these two hormones, if they get messed up very young, the person will fall in love with another guy, which a guy will fall in an intimate sexual way in love with another guy, which shouldn't be. He will trust that person that that is how it's supposed to be. So this emotional love connection, this sexual relation, and this trust where this chemical works in our bodies and our minds, better said in our minds, is so messed up that the person totally believes what's wrong is right and what's right is wrong. This is the second lie. The third lie is, or the second lie was, I will stop later. The thing is, with all the things we have seen, they won't stop unless they go seriously for help. The third lie about pornography is, I'm not hurting other people. It's just me. I'm not hurting other people. If I'm in pornography and I just keep it for myself, I don't hurt anybody, that's a lie. A person that lives in pornography can show no more than, as I already said, than 3% love to another person. So you can see what that will do in a marriage. Some, or the result is that a person is cold, cannot feel for others, self-focused, angry, lives in fear somebody will find out, pulls socially away, becomes a very lonely person inside, or if not, he goes the other direction and goes into prostitution. So the third lie is, I'm not hurting anybody. Does it sound like you don't? <laughs> yes, we do. So that's why it's important to stay away from it. Another important fact is pornography in church stays silent. Statistics say that a very, or first a Bible verse here, Proverbs 30 verse 20 says, This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. I'm just going to take an application out of it. As an adulterous woman is so blinded, so messed up, it says she eats and wipes her mouth and goes from it and says there's nothing wrong. As I just said, what happens when we get messed up that way or a person gets messed up? So does this lady says there's nothing wrong with it. It could also be a guy. He's so messed up and he goes over and does it over and over. They joke about it. They make jokes about it. They, they talk freely about it. They, they are so cold to it that it doesn't bother them anymore. And the application I want to take out of this verse is, as these people do it from one side silent, from the other, other side open, in church it stays maybe silent, and the people struggle with it and do it, know it's wrong, but they don't want to talk about it, but they keep going back to it. And here are some ideas. Statistics say that a very high percentage of church-going people struggle with pornography but they won't talk about it. They keep silent out of fear. What will people think of me? One of the main things. Pornography in church stays silent because the one struggling is willing to pay the price to keep it silent. The cost is damaging, my, the cost is damaging myself and the loved ones around me, my family and so on, and also fellow brothers and sisters in the church. So it's better to go to a trusted person and work it through. Because again, we are hurting other people. Another thing, this is what an expert, expert, ex, an experienced expert said about youth in evangelical churches. There is a higher risk church youth will fall into pornography than others. Now that got, this got my attention. It might be the same for you. Here's the answer, what this guy said. And there is and here's the answer. We just teach 
You're not supposed to look at pornography, but we don't teach what long-term consequences it has. So we just tell them, don't do it, don't do it, stay away from it. So have you ever caught yourself, you're in the store, and it says caution wet floor? What's the first thing goes through your mind? I'm going to find out. <laughs> Isn't it that way? That's our nature. If it says, don't go behind that door, it's only for whoever, you would like to just go by and see what's on the other side. Not maybe go and just see what's on the other side. It's just our nature. And if we just tell our children, young people, let it be, don't do it, it's wrong, it's sinful, and it's all true, but don't teach and give them a glimpse of what I kind of did today, what it involves and what the long-term struggles and consequences are of it, then it would be different. So this expert says, I'm just going to read it again. We just teach, you're not supposed to look at pornography, but we don't teach what long-term consequences it has. The Bible says, run from fornication and morality because God knows the consequences of it. He knows what's going to do to you. And that's why he so tells us, don't do it, run away from it. I have just given you three lies, which are, are the consequences of viewing pornography. Keeping it to yourselves brings guilt. It leads to shame, brings deep wounds. Instead of going to people for help, we go to deeper porn to numb the guilt, shame, and hurt. And that's exactly what Satan wants in the end. But God wants us to come to him and talk to him about it. And if we need personal help from believers, let's be open and find someone who we can trust and help us work through the situation. God wants to help. God wants us to be free. And he sent, sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Imagine Jesus being in the glory of his father, he knew everything he had to go through before he left his glory. He, know, he knew for every sin he would hang on the cross that would be his fault, although he never did one of them. He knew that beforehand. He knew then 2,000 years ago, or a little over 2,000 years ago, according to our calendar, that he hung on the cross for, for all that pornography that people would get into through this technology we have in the world now. He knew that already at that time. And what damage it would do. And he hung on the cross, and God says, you're the one who has done all that. He put all that, what we were supposed to die for, on Jesus, and said, you're guilty of it. And he died for those sins. So that's why you and I can be freed. Steps to resolve immoral addiction, such as pornography. Here's a few ideas. Pray through any emotional need or emotional pain you have experienced from your past. Like I mentioned before, you can say, I forgive you. I can say this, I can say that, or I can say it a hundred times. But if you don't deal with the emotional part, which is many times has to do with bitterness and all kinds of other stuff, then you're probably going to go back to it. Two is identify any sexual abuse that you have experienced that led to a sexual addiction you experienced or to any sexual addictions because of your experience. Identify each way you violated God's moral standards. It's not just saying, oh, I got abused and I got emotionally hurt and I went to it because to cover my emotional pain. That's not a valid excuse, although many do that. But we have to admit because of that we did, we made wrong decisions and we violated God's moral standards. What I've experienced working at a rehab center, when people come into my office or came that time, they are broken hearted, they feel hopeless. They just think there's no hope for me. I've had people said, there is nothing in me that God can even love or will love or ever considered to love. Because when they're deep into pornography and immorality, they feel so guilty, so dirty, so messed up that they see there's no hope. 
And after some time, I've seen them walk out of my office. And if they would have felt free to do it, they would have probably jumped. Because <laughs> they were freed. God freed them. They went through the steps. It doesn't always come easy. It doesn't always happen overnight. But it can happen in a very short time. It doesn't need to happen months or years. As a believer, we confess our sins through faith in Jesus Christ, and he forgives us all our sins. So we have to admit, come to Jesus and admit. As a believer, or as a non-believer, sorry, as a non-believer, we confess our sins through faith in Jesus Christ, and he forgives us all our sins. But after we become a Christian, we fall into whatever sin issue it may be. We may go more detailed with how we approach Jesus and tell him our struggles and failures. We see King David begin with being detailed the way he feels and confesses his sins. Just another thing. People have told me over and over, I have stopped praying. No use. Jesus has time for everybody else, but not for me. He cares for all the other people, but not for me. He loves others, but there's nothing left in me for him to love. No, they might not say it exactly that way, but that's the idea that comes out. Satan wants us to believe a lie that there's no hope. And there is. No matter what addiction, no matter what struggles you have been in, or maybe you're struggling with it and came out of the addiction and you praise God and, and are freed and I'm praising you God, God too if that has happened to you. But if you're struggling with something, there is hope. There is hope. If you have been freed from whatever addiction or stronghold you've been in, steps to stay free from moral addiction such as pornography, number one, guard your thoughts and your desires. It's not your actions that you have to guard. It's what you're thinking and what you're desiring. That must be checked. So many times we have it backwards. It's not your actions that have to be guarded. It's your thinking and your desires that have to be guarded and checked. Proverbs 7.25 says, Let not your heart turn aside to her, her ways. The second one, or the next one is, Obey God's word and seek his wisdom. Proverbs 7.1-5, and won't read that, but uh, there's a good uh, text to read. Do not spend time with a person who is immoral. Proverbs Five verse 8 says, keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Proverbs is so clear, and especially Proverbs of chapter 5. It gives detailed information of what happens and how it all progresses. And that's why he says, keep away far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Never listen to enticing statements of a person who is, is or wants to be involved. Many Bible verses as far as Proverbs 2, 16, 5, 3 to 5, 7, verse 15, 17, verse 21. And there's even more in, in Proverbs. 5, f uh, flee when confronted with an immoral temptation. 1 Corinthians 5, 18, a very short thought here, flee fornication. Now, we have a very wonderful testimony in the Old Testament about Joseph, how he did it. He did exactly what the Scripture said, and he wants us to do that. If married, rejoice in the spouse God has given you and focus emotionally to connect to meet her emotional needs so that she feels safe and is able to trust you. Same for the guy. The emotional connection is what drives a sexual relationship. God's design for us is to be attractive to one another in a sexual way. There is nothing wrong with enjoying your spouse, and God wants us to do that. But for that, we have to clean up whatever is hindering it. So here we have steps to stay free from immoral, immoral addictions such as pornography. So to wrap it up this evening, I'll go shortly over the four aspects, facts we have looked at. 
And the one is how pressure patterns form a person which can lead to addiction. And I just want to give you a few examples to understand this. For example, disciplined people tend to put pressure on others. There are some in this room that are very disciplined and there are some that aren't. And that's normal. Both of them are okay. <laughs> but that's just how we are. Being a disciplined person is not a bad thing. But that discipline can damage a a uh, damaged person around them if there is an impulsive person that can't focus with the pressure of a disciplined person with expect expectations. To be a dominant person or to be assertive is not a bad thing. But when your assertiveness overwhelms someone who's submissive, you can damage them and to be impulsive or Submissive is not a bad thing, but can hurt the discipline and the person with expectations by nagging them or by sarcasm. It's not always that way, but I've seen it so many things or so many times that submissive people and impulsive people have a way of getting back to the dominant, disciplined, and so on. So both start under pressure, start hurting each other. So how pressure patterns hurt us, it can be from the pressure in general, what we live under, or it can be from our own spouse or circumstances in our lives. And we want to learn to understand ourselves so we learn to not nag and be sarcastic or pressure with dominance or assertiveness, but to learn to do or to live and to treat each other with love the way God designed it. I'm going to throw a little bit of a loop in here. There was a time in our marriage, and this is about me, not about our, my wife, that when I got pressured, I would literally pinch her. And she would say, ouch. And I thought to myself, yeah, it's supposed to hurt. You know how you pressured me? <laughs> but I found out that wasn't the right way. That's what we do. We somehow react to what we feel. One way or the other, we try to get even, but that's not the way. We have to let God help us and respond in love, even if we don't get love. Can we get that? <laughs> respond in love, even if we don't get love? <laughs> Whenever, whatever the personality, talents God has given us, we should be careful to use them to help other people and not to provoke anybody to end up being in severe or being severely hurt and go to any kind of addiction or sin issue. So shortly, pressure. It can come in different forms, and we have to learn to deal with it. And even if people that are dominant, disciplined, and have expectations, those are the ones that normally put pressure on people. And we need those people. If they aren't in this church, then nothing would get done. <laughs> but we have to learn to get to know ourselves and how to use that talent that God has given us in love so God is, uh, is being glorified. And you know what? If you do it with the love of God, people love you. They like to work under those people that have expectations, that have plans, that tell you what to do. If they do it with love, people love to work under those people. It's not that it is always the other way. It's, there's a good part in it. The other one is how abuse forms a person which can lead to addiction. Abuse is always wrong. It doesn't matter if it has to do with physical abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, verbal abuse. It is always sinful because it's always direct against God because we're created in God's image. That's as short as it is. How emotional grief tower affects a person and leads to addiction? A few thoughts. When it comes to the emotional buildup from over time in our lives, it is key that we resolve the emotional areas of discomfort that we carry so that our present relationship will not be negatively affected. Unresolved emotional hurts causes us to build walls to protect our hearts or ourselves from further hurt. We do not allow others to get close lest they hurt us like we have been damaged in the past. Neither can we give love if we have been too emotionally damaged. A few thoughts. 
under emotional grief tower. This emotional grief tower starts building in us, one after the other. And with time, it makes us so cold, and we close off. In other words, we build a wall, and we hide behind that wall to protect ourselves. And sometimes in that wall, behind that wall, and in that wall is all this emotional stuff. Behind that wall is all the sin issues that we use. And that could very, very well be some kind of addiction. There are four steps to resolve addictional addictions and to stay free, accord, uh, quoting from Caring for the Heart ministry uh, material. One is identify the unmet emotional need, inappropriate love, and any emotional pain they experienced. Number one, identify the unmet emotional need and inappropriate love and any emotional pain they experienced. Lead them in a prayer or help them through in a prayer to resolve each area of damage. Help them to understand the cause that led them to their addiction. Number two, resolve their sexual abuse pain through prayer. It's the only way you can do it. Jesus is the one that hung on the cross for all those abuse issues. Not the counselor, not a pastor, not a well trained or meant person or a very spiritual person. It's Jesus alone. Three, lead them to acknowledge, confess, and repent of their past moral sins and whatever they have gone into. Four, lead them to emotionally connect with another person who can meet their emotional need, help them resolve the issue of emotional pain, and help them understand how, the, how to resolve those issues in their hearts. So they need, we need other people. That's why God created us, for relationships. He didn't create us to be alone. But sin and addictions does exactly that. Uh, isolates us. Closes us off. We can be a person that might be always among people, but very closed inside. We put on this nice, friendly face and smile, but deep down we are the most lonely, saddest, hopeless person that walks in the middle of that society or church or whatever it is. First Peter 4, 8. We've come to conclusion with these two verses, which we started with. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. John 8, verse 31 says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So according to God's word, in a nutshell, God's love and God's truth will set us free through Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Our part is, are we willing to give in and say, I'll let God do that for me. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank and praise you for your love, your mercy, your kindness, your grace, your patience that you have with us. We have nothing except just to say thank you, Lord, for what you all did, did for us. No matter what our circumstances are, no matter how messed up we got, you came and took all that on yourself, and you died for us, and you gave us hope. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.